talking about how historic a place. Is. Um, so um, I'm always happy to be here. So let me begin. Um, Um, except it moves two slides. Um, so let's start with a math joke. A physicist, a biologist, and a mathematician are sitting on a bench across from a house. Uh, they watch as two people go into the house, and then a little later, three people walk out. Then the physicist says something. Um, so my question, I haven't finished the joke because my purpose was not to um, recite a joke, but the question I have to ask all of you, when you read what you read on that slide, how did you imagine the physicist and the biologist and the mathematician, male or female? Male. When we hear the word mathematician or when we hear the word physicist, um, often, biologist even, the image that comes to our mind generally, most of the time, is that of a male. Uh, because we are conditioned in many ways to think of um, anyone, you know, even doctor, engineer, right, scientist, mathematician, all of them, the, the cultural conditioning forces us to imagine these people to be men rather than women. And there is a historical reason for all of that. So the common um, perceptions we have for mathematicians, and this applies, I'm, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, I will say mathematician, but a lot of it applies in general to sciences also. So we uh, perceive the mathematician to be male, and we think of mathematics as a discipline to be very logical, which is true. There are you know logical elements in this subject, and not for its own sake. It was for many years in old days, especially. Um, people thought that mathematics was an activity of leisure that there is no uh, practical value to mathematics. Uh, so you're, um, if you are a person or a man of privilege, you have free time on your hand and you are very you know, bright and brilliant, you can engage in mathematical research or in doing mathematics. Um, generally, the, the whole issue of you may also want to raise families. Um, so, when you think of the discipline as something as being um, and, and you have, you perceive women as being very emotional and having the responsibilities of raising families, then women become an anomaly when it comes to a subject like mathematics. Then you don't imagine them to have a role um, in doing mathematics. So the role that is imagined historically is that of raising families. Um, and the fact is that many of the female mathematicians have had, historically, have had delayed um, sort of career, uh, start of career as a delayed start uh, because they were raising families. Um, and I'll give some examples towards the end. Um, it may come as a surprise to you. Um, let me just check there is no... Um, uh, it may come as a surprise to you that universities like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, which are considered to be like the top universities, if somebody said, you know, name three top universities of the world, most people will name these three. They did not admit women until the 20th century. Um, if you look at editorial boards of women, uh, sorry, editorial boards of mathematics journals. Only 9% of them, uh, of the editors are women. It's a very minuscule number, 
I'm mentioning uh, math and editorial boards in the mathematics world. Um, made um, as to, you know, will this particular paper be published or not? Um, and it has a very, uh, these editorial boards have a very strong role to play in what kind of research is encouraged uh, in a particular discipline. So when you have a very minuscule number of women in such roles, that has an overall effect um, on the discipline. Um, for Cambridge University, even now, there is no full professor in pure mathematics at Cambridge University. In mathematics, even now, there is no professor. By full professor, I mean professor as we use here. Not associate professor or assistant professor, but a professor. Um, their applied mathematics department does have one professor. Uh, what is interesting is that Cambridge University used to have um, a math um, competition very early on, um, from, I mean, more than 100 years ago. It was called math, it still is called math tripos. In 1890, so that's more than 100 years ago, a young woman taught this exam. So it's not a question of women don't have the ability. It's a question of do they have the opportunities. Philippa Fawcett uh, taught the math tripos in 1890. Um, but her name was not put um, on the list when they announced the you know, list of people who have passed the exam. Uh, the list is announced in terms of the ranking, who was first, who was second, who was. Her name was not at the top. Can you imagine why? The reason her name was not listed there is because they didn't want the male students to think that, oh, a female has um, done better than us. So even though she had taught the exam, her name was sort of put aside separately with the score and a male name was put at the top of the list. That's the kind of uh, prejudice that there has always existed. Uh, we think of the US as a very advanced country. Even now, only 15% of full-time tenured positions, tenured is uh, basically permanent positions. Um, in uh, departments that offer doctoral programs, only 15% of the full-time positions are given to women. Um, so the situation is not very conducive worldwide overall um, for women mathematicians. And there is a term that uh, Burton, L. Burton used. It, uh, he he's compares culture of mathematics versus the mathematics culture. And what does he mean by that? Culture of mathematics is all the discipline related aspects of mathematics that Mathematics as a discipline is, uh, we, you know, mathematicians think of it as a very beautiful subject, that the ideas within mathematics are beautiful. Um, we often describe, if you see a proof, you would say, oh, this is a beautiful proof, or this is not a beautiful proof. Uh, proofs are regarded as beautiful, depending on are they brief, or what are the logical arguments given, and so on. So the kind of things that culture of mathematics uh, describes is uh, or are basically discipline centric or discipline specific uh, aspects. Um, so uh, is it beautiful? You know, is it is the proof brief? Um, is your proof rigorous and so on? Uh, are there any gaps in the proof? While as the mathematics culture is something else, is the environment around you when you're doing mathematics. The societal conditioning, when you imagine, when I put the first slide up and I asked, uh, you know, did you imagine the mathematician to be male? Most of you said yes. That is cultural conditioning. And that kind of conditioning affects in your homes, what kind of messages are you receiving on a daily departments when you go to conferences, 
um, what kind of messages do they receive, sort of the reception they get on versus males. In classrooms, there have been studies done where um, they um, studied classrooms where a teacher would ask a question. And if a male student and a female student both raise their hands to answer the question, teacher is more likely to ask the male student to answer. This is a uh, fact. It has been studied and uh, shown through several studies that there is a certain bias in classrooms and schools that uh, teachers more tend to call on the, I mean, tend to call on the male students more often than female students. So female students often feel neglected in the classrooms. Um, it is also um, apparent also uh, this mathematics culture in terms of sort of outside the classroom, what kind of engagement do students and teachers have if the teacher is male, and this is more generally at an adult uh, stage with universities and colleges. Um, you know, many universities, if the teacher says, okay, I can answer your questions later in the evening, come and see me in my home or in my office, female students will be less likely to go than male students if the teacher is male. So all of that combined is the mathematics culture. And it has a very strong effect on how um, students look at mathematics and the choices that they often make. Um, so now this has a direct effect on occupation. When you go for jobs, what kind of jobs are available to you? Depends on what kind of degrees you have gotten, what subjects you have studied. So cultural norms are key drivers of occupational segregation. If your culture is such that you are not encouraged to study science and you are not encouraged to study mathematics, you are already um, sort of um, stopped from certain jobs. Uh, that's an indirect consequence. Um, so even with advances in science, education, young women are generally excluded from participating in science and technology. This is a fact. This is not just one region in particular, but overall. Um, this thing is not... Um, so as I said earlier, the stereotyping that happens in mathematics uh, in terms of women being seen as emotional beings, um, the logic versus the emotional, you know, emotion binary, that if you're logical, then you go to sciences. If you're emotional, you should study arts and humanities. Um, that excludes women from certain positions, certain leadership roles also. Um, when, when it comes to jobs, then obviously economic equality becomes an issue. If you don't have access to certain jobs, which may be high paying jobs, um, then you are uh, at a disadvantage. For every hundred rupees, and this is a sort of a um, worldwide figure, that, so uh, an average, for every hundred rupees, earns only 79 rupees for the same work. Um, they don't, women don't have access to employment positions of leadership and decision making. Uh, one of the figures I, um, I had seen a few months ago, for example, if you look at bank accounts, um, uh, women have um, why am I talking about bank accounts? Because often it is an indicator of um, economic empowerment for women, for anybody, in fact, for men as well as women. So having access to a bank account, having access to uh, a means to save money um, is, is something that uh, should be accessible to everybody. Um, going back and forth, it's much easier to.
Um, so globally, it's not a surprise that uh, women are still far, there is no economic uh, equality. Um, so this is rural Kashmir, um, only 24% women own property and in, in the urban areas, only 19%. Again, another indicator of economic disempowerment. Um, the greatest barrier in closing the economic gender gap, this is a very important um, element, is that women are underrepresented in emerging roles and technologies. If you look at uh, where are the current jobs? We have traditionally been told, you know, you go into medicine, you go into engineering, right? Um, this is where the jobs are. Even in engineering these days, there aren't many jobs available. But there are other fields where there are a lot of jobs. Um, data sciences, for example, artificial intelligence, computing, and talking in terms of the STEM-related uh, subjects. And here women are underrepresented. So they are at a disadvantage already. If you don't have enough women graduating with degrees in some of these subjects, then their job opportunities in the future are limited. Um, there will be fewer of them in these fields. Um, so it's a very small group of women who are studying these subjects uh, account for only uh, less than one fourth or less than 25% of the total. Uh, it's a very dismal figure when you think of the you know, population representation would be 50%, um, but it's, it ranges from 10 to 25%. Uh, and so this is where improvement needs to be made. Um, so only three to 30% of uh, women take STEM related subjects. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so what is needed? Let me see. Um, this keeps going. Um, enabling environment that encourages young, young women to study STEM subjects. So it needs to begin at home. Parents need to encourage their boys as well as their girls to study subjects that have uh, better job opportunities, so STEM-related subjects. Uh, in classrooms, teachers need to be aware of, uh, you know, the pressure and the cultural conditioning and so on, and need to be more encouraging um, towards women. Um, and then at workplace, the environment has to be um, very encouraging for men as well as women. So that whole culture needs to be uh, started at home, but um, uh, continued in classrooms and in workplaces. Um, we need a greater proportion of women with uh, these skills in STEM-related subjects, and we need an equal representation in jobs that require, but the, the last thing will not happen unless there are enough women who study these subjects. Um, what is very important is role models, that women need role models from these fields. Um, there need to be women's networks where, um, so for example, in mathematics, you know, there are um, different organizations that say, you know, women in mathematics, for example. Um, there is in the U.S. there's an association for women in mathematics. In India, there is a uh, women uh, in mathematics, um, Indian women in mathematics. So these are organizations that serve as um, uh, sort of an enabling um, clique or environment where other women mathematicians, young women who are interested in mathematics, can come and listen to other women see what problems they had faced, um, what are the ways in which you can address those issues, and also find role models. Now, these, these networks are often a good place where you can find uh, role models. Uh, leadership that has to be very responsive and inclusive. This is very important. This is where people like us who are in positions 
where you know we may have students i'm a teacher in my classroom i have to be um, aware of uh, ensuring that both the men as well as the women feel uh, comfortable in asking questions feel comfortable in exploring other ideas different ideas within mathematics and feel welcome in this whole environment of mathematics or science in general so leadership is very important as i said if you look at the editorial boards of these science journals they are the ones who determine what kind of research will be funded often or even agencies that um, uh, approve grants you know what kind of projects will be funded it's very important that women need to be in those positions as well and the last thing is perseverance because you may face a lot of challenges but you need to be strong and you need to have faith in yourself and i will um 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 this i want to be spoken so we need as i was saying we need leadership um that's very uh, encouraging inclusive um and i just want to because i don't want to um, delay this i want to just briefly talk about these two uh, women in mathematics just as examples of you may face a lot of hardships um in your particular field but you should not give up sophie germain was uh born um at a time she was french she was born at a time when women were not allowed to study mathematics or sciences um in fact it was said that if women study these hard sciences like maths you know physics chemistry uh, their ovaries will shrink doctors used to tell parents that so don't put your girls in math don't let them study science because their ovaries will shrink at that time she wanted to study mathematics she had her father had a library and she chanced upon some math books and she was interested in them her parents found out that she was studying the math books they barred they told her you cannot she still continued to go into the library at night and she would study then they found out that she is going there in the night so they took her candles away even her night clothes so that she couldn't get out of bed but she persevered and uh, finally was able to study and became quite well known as a mathematician another example is more modern um, situation mary ellen rudin um her husband was walter rudin if any of you have ever studied mathematics real analysis there's a very famous book um by walter rudin on real analysis he is like this is the book on real analysis she was walter rudin's wife they had both uh, studied um and gotten phd and then he got a job Uh, at university of wisconsin which is very which has a very good math program and she was the wife even though they both had the same degree but he was the breadwinner so he had the job she raised four children and during that period she also taught courses at the university as an adjunct um like one course a semester and she did this for almost 30 years and in her free time while she was raising four children uh, she continued to publish um, very good research and then suddenly one day university of wisconsin realized that we have this person who has been coming here for 20 years or so and her publications outnumber many of the permanent faculty we have on in the department and she was doing 10 times better than many of the male faculty in the department so they realized that and they hired her as a full professor eventually it, it took almost um, 20 30 years for that to happen uh, but this is an example of a mathematician who was a real mathematician who continued in spite of you know raising kids um um not having a full time job and not 
being treated as a mathematician in her workplace, um, she continued to be a mathematician and, and published and eventually was recognized um, as a full-fledged mathematician in her own right. If she had given up in the early stages, we would not have the advances in mathematics that she helped um, with her, you know, during her research. So, so the, this is where I'll stop, but I just want to say that there will be, a, to the young women in the audience that, and the young men also, that you may have challenges uh, that you have to face, whether you are in college, whether you are in a job. Uh, uh, don't stop believing in yourself, um, believing in the kind of work that you do. You need to persevere and you need to sort of be persistent in what you are trying to achieve. Um, this is where I'll stop. Thank you. I'll thank uh, Dr. Fozia for this insightful lecture. It has made our audience culturally responsive. responsive. Uh, I would like to request Chairman to open the session for question answers and interaction. In fact, this is a different type of program. The methodology to be followed is quite different. This is a specialistic talk. This is not purely a seminar type of activity where the talk is subject to the proceeding. It's a specialistic talk, and therefore I don't think there is any scope of having any possible. Sir, sir, I have one thing to say about the lecture uh, from Ozerman. Uh, I think it was uh, we are talking about the uh, woman education. And uh, as you came into your lecture, you started uh, and, uh, and uh, as a real mathematician student, there is no woman professor in the top most university. And there is no woman in the research literature goals. No, I didn't say that. No. I said only so I mean, no. just I want some no. No. Like the research board like the literature of research in which journal whether the paper is suitable for the publishing the journal or not. So there is no such a woman and also but all this is related to the woman education this is what I am saying to at a peak level in the university level where we have a woman professor, a woman scientist, a woman doctors. But if I come to the less F level, I can F level. So now you said what are the remedies, what are the objectives like that you can educate the woman and baby scientists and other things. I am uh, uh, working in this field, I know you from uh, New York and I have been in this field. Uh, what will be the recommendation? Uh, how we can make a progress so that we can provide the best education to the woman child? So that yeah, uh, there should be no see the physics. Uh, out of 50 students in physics, we have just uh, uh, 50 women uh, students at college level. In university level, it is just uh, five students. Same thing is with the mathematics. So the problem lies in the elementary school education. Either the parents are not sending the woman ch child to the school, or there is what kind of recommendation or recommendation has to do with as you have gone through so much of that, uh, there, there are two issues. One is, uh, first of all, I can say there are no women in the editorial board. I said only a small percentage. Yeah, so 9%. 9%. 9%. But what you, uh, it's a very important question, but there are two issues there. Uh, my talk was focused more about mathematics and sciences in general. But there are two issues. One is girls in schools not studying science. What the second issue is girls not studying. Forget science. They are not sent to schools. But what you were saying, many parents don't send them to school. That's a bigger problem. I was talking more in terms of when girls are in schools or in college, colleges, they tend to shy away from studying mathematics or STEM related subjects. Even when they study, the encouragement that they should get 
is not there necessarily. Sometimes it is, but not in general. The issue that you are talking about is a more serious issue. It's that girls are stopped from sending for school. That's an entirely different issue. But in this context, in the context of my talk, I did say that it begins at home, that we need that kind of encouragement. Um, I said at home in classrooms and then at workplaces. But it begins at home. Then in classrooms where we as teachers have a, a responsibility that we encourage female students just as much as we encourage male students. I don't want to leave them out either. The study that I was talking about where you know teachers have a tendency to, if a boy and a girl both raise their hands to say that I know the answer, they will call on the boy more often than not. The other factor is that if you look at the uh, nowadays in many of the bigger cities and so on where there is a sizable number of women that science subjects, up to the college level, I know in the US this is also true, uh, up to college level it may be 50-50, that 50% women and 50% men in a classroom, math classroom let's say. Then when you get to the master's level, that 50% drop, you may have to have. Then when you go from master's to PhD, there is a further drop. Then when you go from PhD to postdoc, or an entry level job, there is a further drop. So by the time you get to the senior full professor position, it's a very small number. So question is what happens between college and uh, master's or PhD? It's the kind of um, lack of encouragement, I would say. Because STEM, you know, mathematics, I would say it's not an easy subject to study. You, it requires hard work, it requires dedication, it requires um, I often tell my students that the best way to learn mathematics is to practice. Practice, practice, practice. You do a problem 10 times, then you understand the nuances of it. So it's a question of um, when, when a young woman who is trying to study mathematics also is then uh, given the responsibility of it is not that that kind of work is not important, but it is not necessarily shared with her brother. Uh, and also, um, um, it also sends a different signal to her that your study of mathematics or STEM is not that crucial. So there are a lot of factors like that which affect. But what what we can do? I mean, I am speaking as a teacher. I have control over my classroom, so I can make a difference in that classroom. And I'm happy to say that in our university, the, that 50-50 is there for even the PG program. And in fact, for our PhD program, it's also 50-50. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this uh, exciting question and answer session. Uh, so shall we proceed to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Sharik, Sharik Rashid Masoodi. He is Senior Professor and Head of Unit of Pediatrics, Endocrinology and Diabetes Schemes, Srinagar. He is Sub-Dean of Academics, Schemes, Srinagar. Chairman, Institutional Ethics Committee, IUST, Kashmir. He's a visiting professor, University of Maryland, School of Medicine, Baltimore, USA and he's the Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Medical Sciences. So I welcome you all. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I would first like to thank the organizers, 
particularly Dr. Mayra for giving me this opportunity. I'm also fortunate to listen to Dr. Fozia, a very insightful lecture. Thank you, madam. I hope she's here. So the topic I have chosen is improving the lifestyle of women as a key contributor to the meet, to meeting the sustainable development goals of 2030. So I start with 2015. I used to be a bit tracker during my medical college days, but then everything stopped in 1990s. So when I returned back in 2014 from USA, the first thing I wanted to do was trekking. So 2015, I started doing trekking. And this is a place called Chiranbal, Kulgaon, very beautiful place in the middle. 2015 was also important for the, it was actually a landmark year for multilateralism and international policy shaping with the adoption of several major agreements. It was in 2015 we had Paris Agreement on Climate Change. But the most important, there was a policy about transforming our world the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development with its 17 goals, SDG, uh, SDG goals, was adapted at uh, UN. So these goals were no poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, and so on and so forth. But the most important one uh, was obviously from my point of view because I belong to medical, uh, I belong to health. So this good health. And this of course is interlinked to all these goals. Come December 2019, a tiny particle, a 100 kilo Dalton particle was found in a Wuhan, uh, China, which became soon an epidemic and then a pandemic. It engulfed the whole world, you know that. And if you see yesterday's data I took from WHO site, it shows 242 million people affected, or almost 50 lakh deaths, half a crore deaths. So of course, this hit everything. So uh, these goals were also hit. Students stopped going to school, investment stopped, people were pushed to poverty, businesses were stopped, leading to some 255 million jobs were lost. And poverty level, which was never seen in 20 years, so that level was, it went down so much. So it is setting back on decades of progress in tackling global poverty. And COVID-19 particularly affected women because women were harder hit because economically because uh, they are a large proportion of workers in sectors severely affected by COVID-19, including accommodation and food services and in frontline occupations such as health and social care sectors. So WHO came to this policy, Women Rise for All. It was a policy for uh, financing a future for women. This event was held in March, I think, uh, last year. No, this year. And then the, it focused on paving the way towards a resilient and a sustainable economic recovery with women's equity at its core. So let us go away from economy for some time. Of course, COVID was very devastating for socioeconomic status for economy. But we may be able to recover in economy, but what we have lost is human beings. It's nearly 5 million deaths, half a crore deaths. And though majority recovered, 95% recovered, 98% recovered, but who were these people who died? These were people who were elderly, they had hypertension, they had diabetes, they had uh, respiratory disease already existing like COPD, they had cancer. And most of the deaths happened because of cardiovascular disease. We thought 
this coronavirus causes respiratory failure so let us give them ventilation give them oxygen but then certainly we found blood was clotting they were getting heart attacks and those people who had existing heart disease died more and what was found that covid-19 death rates were 10 times higher in countries where most adults were overweight or obese so obesity diabetes hypertension copd cancer ultimately heart disease were the conditions which led to death if you see data of who just before this 2019 uh, the major cause of death were what we call them non communicable disease or non infective disease or lifestyle diseases topped by heart disease stroke copd diabetes the red ones are infective causes which included lower respiratory infection of pneumonia tuberculosis and viral diseases but come covid obviously covid came to the third spot as a cause of death is infective cause this is data from us but applies to all other places but it also contributed to hard people who had heart disease cancer stroke in them that morbidity and mortality was more so all these diseases hypertension diabetes cancer we call them lifestyle diseases so what is a lifestyle disease diseases associated the way a person or a group of people live these include atherosclerosis you know with age our arteries our blood vessels become hardened what is called atherosclerosis which gets accelerated if you have high blood pressure if you have diabetes if you have high cholesterol levels obesity and other conditions like smoking alcohol and substance abuse there are many other lifestyle diseases but these are the most common uh, that we are discussing so the topic is because we are focusing on women empowerment so i would like to concentrate on lifestyle diseases in women which are the same but there are some more issues in this like infertility backache depression general anxiety disorder apart from heart disease obesity hypertension and diabetes there was an article before this covid started in time magazine that reported women die from heart attacks more often than men generally it is believed that men have more heart attacks that's true but that was true before 1987 but after 97 what was observed there was a reduction in death rates among men while women began to surpass men in heart diseases so by 2017 men and women experienced a similar rates of death from heart disease We could discuss the reasons, but we don't have the time. But this was reported in uh, like American Heart Journal, Association Journal, Circulation also. And uh, there are many striking things about heart disease in women. Heart disease means macrovascular disease. Stroke also you can include in that. So women have been found to have higher lifetime risk of stroke than men. 64% of women who die suddenly of coronary artery disease have no previous symptoms. So you don't have any symptom which the lady would make, it. I mean, she could become conscious and take preventive measures. And 80% of heart disease and stroke events may be prevented by lifestyle. This is very important. That 80% of these situations, we may be able to prevent it through a lifestyle modification and education. So if you want to prevent, so we need to understand what are the risk factors, why some people get this heart disease. Of course, there are some factors which are not modifiable, like you are every day are older than the yesterday. So as you age, your arteries also age. So the chance of stroke or heart disease or uh, other related disease are higher. But we can't do about it, anything about this. Same way gender. Previously was said men, now say women, whatever it is, we can't change our gender. And familial factors, there are people who have familial factors, hereditary factors, again, we cannot change. But good part is most of the factors which lead to heart disease are modifiable. 
like hypertension, diabetes, overweight, obesity, high cholesterol, smoking, physical inactivity, substance abuse. So let us come to the first, first factor, which is hypertension. WHO says that hypertension kills 1.5 million people in South Asia alone annually. And is a silent killer, WHO said in 2002, there are no symptoms of hypertension. Normally we say, if you have headache, we say it's got blood pressure, hoga. good. If you have headache, check your blood pressure. But most of the times you have no symptoms. Unless you check it, you will not know it. So you need certain amount of blood pressure, pressure in the arteries to move, make the blood move in the arteries of heart, arteries of brain, arteries of kidneys. But if this pressure becomes too much, and if the artery has become hardened, then the damage starts happening. And the, that is why we say optimal blood pressure would be something like 120 or 80 millimeters of mercury. The 120 is called systolic, the lower one is called diastolic. Then we have prehypertension. And if your BP is 140 by 90 or more, it is hypertension. Those the guidelines recommended have been changing, but 140 by 90 or more is clearly hypertension. And fortunately, we have data which shows this one is from our group. We have a we have a group of 500 plus scientists under the banner of NCD risk collaboration. It has lead authors from uh, King's College London and from Harvard uh, Public Health uh, Institute. So it shows that if we adopt a dual approach to hypertension, now number one, we focus on primary prevention, and second, we try to treat people, we can, we can re reduce uh, this even in lower income uh, countries, middle income settings, we can have good results. So what it was referring to 80% of strokes and heart disease are preventable, 30 decades at least. The second risk factor we talk about is diabetes, which often happens in combination with hypertension. So. It's taking time, so. so what is diabetes? Diabetes is a disorder characterized by increased blood sugar levels, which we call medically hyperglycemia, due to defective insulin secretion, insulin action, or both. Either the insulin, which is the law, which is the key for allowing this glucose to enter into the cells for metabolism, for energy production, either that key is missing or that key is defective, it is not entering the lock. The lock is not uh, opening. So the result is the sugar level goes up in the bloodstream while the cells where it are supposed to be utilized are suffering. So the criteria we say we can have several ways. If somebody has symptoms like nocturia or you're getting a lot of urination or somebody is getting excessive uh, appetite and despite that is losing weight or somebody has uh, what we call poly, uh, polyphagia, polyuria and uh, polydipsia, thirst you feel all the time. So if you just do a casual sugar of 200, it is diabetes. But if you have no symptoms and you rely on a fasting sugar, if it is 126 or more, it is diabetes. If you do after eating, two hours after eating, if it is 200 or more, it is diabetes. And there is another test called HBAOC or glycogen hemoglobin. A1C, which is if it is 6.5 or more, is diabetes. There's a category of pre diabetes also, which is like below 100 sugar is normal, 100 to 125 is pre diabetes. Same way, below 140 after eating is normal, 140 to 199 is pre diabetes. Now, when we talk about diabetes, we mean, we mean diabetes mellitus. And diabetes mellitus has several, several uh, types. But the commonest we is a type two. So out of ten, we'll be having nine people have type, type, having type two. So whenever I say diabetes or somebody says diabetes, presume it is type two diabetes mellitus. And this again data from our uh, uh, our uh, research group, which had come, I think in uh, I think it had come 2015 that they won't see the prevalence, so prevalence changes as per the definition used. But if you use the present uh, criteria, then we had a significant increase, four-time increase from 1980 to 2014. In 
108 million in 1980, which was means 4.3 percent. This quadrupled four times, it is 422 million, which means 42 crore in 2014. And if you go by Diabetes Atlas, it obviously for two years they didn't issue any data, but last data said 463 million people living with diabetes in 2019, which means 46.3 crore people. I think these are only two countries which have population more than that. That is China and India. So if diabetics someday decide to make a country, it will be the third largest country. So now, what has been propelling this epidemic of diabetes and hypertension and cholesterol? So it is what we call overweight obesity. So that brings us to a third risk factor for modifiable risk factor for obesity. Obesity is excess accumulation of fat in the body. Normally you have some fat which is beneficial. But if this is too much, when somebody's weight increases and apparently person is not going to gym, is not developing muscles, person doesn't have edema, person is apparently okay. So whenever somebody says my weight has gone up, it means fat has gone up, fat mass has gone up. So there are two traditional ways. Two, one is we measure the weight and get an index called BMI or body mass index. We divide the weight by square of the height. So we get an index and if you are Asian, then a BMI of below 23 is supposed to be normal. If it is from 23 to 25, it is called overweight. And if you are more than 25, it is obese. If you compare the Western classification of BMI, in that they say uh, below 25 is normal, 25 to 29.9 is, no, uh, is, uh, is sorry uh, overweight, and 30 onwards is that, uh, obese. But because Asians, Indians have more fat for the same BMI, that is why WHO has made a more uh, a different criteria for this thing. And many people by weight may not be having obesity. And many people tell me, sir, I was, when I was in college, I, I was 70 kgs and now I'm also 70 kgs. So I have not become obese. But then we measure his abdominal girth and we find that he has lost five kgs of muscle in his arms, legs, elsewhere, and he has gained five kgs of fat in the abdomen, which is called central obesity. So by weight, he is not obese, but if you see his waist measurement, he is obese or she is obese. So that we have criteria, again, separate for Asian Indian populations. So if you are, as a lady, if you have 80 centimeter or more, your abdominal girth, you are overweight or obese. And for obesity, Europeanite, uh, Europeans, Western, if it is 94 or more, they are what we call them obese. Now, this again data from our research group, and they try to see the trends in the body mass index. What they found that if the present trends continue, by 2025, global obesity prevalence will reach 18% men, means out of five, one person be obese. And it will surpass 21% women. So more women are having obesity. Now, it is not now women alone, it is children also. The childhood obesity is a big problem these days. And again, our data shows that there is a rising trend in children's and adolescent BMI. In fact, obesity has become now global obesity. It is so global that everywhere you see. And childhood obesity can lead to type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, where you, you, have, you have to use a device during night, fatty liver disease. Previously, if somebody liver failure would happen, it would be because of hepatitis or alcohol. Presently, if anybody goes for liver transplant, invariably it's because of fat-induced damage, what is called steatohepatitis and NAFLD. So again, it starts with childhood obesity, which progresses. And there's a condition called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which again is a part of the same myriad. So obesity, if you see the data, this is obviously we have, your, uh, we have a data from
throat or point. Anyway, so you can see the the let your point rest here. So, if you see the data, it is showing on the left side how we time the, it has become darker, dark colors have become, so it shows how obesity has increased. And this one is, these are 50 states of USA, of course, two are, eight, 48 are there, two are outside mainland. So, you can see the area where it is dark red. These are the places where the obesity is at the highest. And if you see, if you see the same area, you have the highest deaths, mortality rate in women. That was 2017 data. So that shows that obesity has a direct relation with heart attacks, particularly in women. Now, how does obesity do this? It leads to insulin resistance that insulin is not able to do the job. So in the process, insulin levels go up. And a lot of things happen with this insulin resistance. So it leads to hypertension, it leads to diabetes, it leads to dyslipidemia, what we call that good cholesterol HDL goes down, bad cholesterol goes up, triglyceride is a fat which goes up. And then you can have many other things. You have a hypogonadism, you can have malignancies like breast cancer, colon cancer, and you can have um, infertility and so many things. So the, in the center you have this insulin resistance because of obesity. I don't have time to tell you about all the, all the statistics about obesity, but I want to tell you about one condition, PCOS, where the defect is same what is in diabetes, what is in hypertension, what we call insulin resistance. Because of insulin resistance, they get more male hormones. Normally every female has some amount of male hormone, testosterone and others, which is very important. But if this hormone level goes up, it does like hair growth, what is called hirsutism, acne or pimples, and you can see on the neck, the dark is called acanthosis. So when my patients come to me in OPD, they want to say test. I say, I, know, I don't need the test. I can see your neck and I can see there is acanthosis and you have all insulin resistance. So you are on the way to develop diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, unless you take care of it now. I'm not interested in treating, treating your acne. Of course, it's important, but this is a temporary thing. I'm not interested in treating your hirsutism. It's a cosmetic problem. Uh, can be managed by local treatment, and it will also not be an issue in the long run. But why I'm taking you to my OPD is because I know you are at risk of so many things, and I have to act now. So there are so many uh, health risks with uh, PCOS, obesity, insulin resistance, and uh, all of them are called lifestyle diseases. Now, there's one more ask, but the story doesn't end here. Dr. Barker in 90s gave a hypothesis, what is called fetal origin of diabetes or fetal origin of adult disease. He postulated that if you have fetal malnutrition, it can lead adaptive change in the fetus, which in the later on may manifest the disease in the adult. So, uh, the malnutrition doesn't necessarily mean un undernutrition, though he meant that I'm undernutrition. But malnutrition can be excess nutrition also. So too much of uh, calories are coming. So fetus has adapted to things, which later on leads to diabetes and many other things. So there were so many articles have come on this. And even the books have been written. There's a book by uh, Research Society of uh, UK, Fetal Program Influences. Development of disease in later in life. So when you have a lady who has insulin resistance, who has obesity, who has PCOS, we know it, is, it doesn't stop with her. It starts with the, her offsprings in due course of time. If she doesn't take care, she'll be programming the future generations because of this problem. Uh, we don't have time to discuss, but there's so many ways a fetal uh, programming can happen when you have malnutrition in terms of undernutrition or overnutrition and a poor lifestyle. So now often people ask, why this epidemic? Why it has happened? So the question why is, is very difficult for scientists. We can say how it happened, but we can never answer why it happened. 
Anyway, people with familial obesity may blame it on their sheer genes, but they also share the diet and lifestyle habits that may contribute to obesity. People often say, Achana's family must say, Nishka karo. Of course, genetic background is there, but scientists say that in the last 10,000 years, our gene pool has changed 0.3%. So if I have bad genes, my father was, my mother also was supposed to have bad genes, my grandmother also, my grandfather also. But they did not express diabetes, they did not express hypertension, they did not have a cholesterol problem. Why me? Why I have PCOS? Because those genes have been able to express now because of the environment we have created. So the genes are working, but through the environment. So I cannot say I cannot change my genes. It is that environment that changes the genes. So the reasons are, one is, of course, people previously used to die because of infectious diseases, diarrhea, plague, cholera, tuberculosis, typhoid. So if a mother had 10 children, only two will survive. So the average lifespan was less than 30. So most people will die before 30 years. So they would not live long enough to get diabetes, long enough to get obesity, long enough to get hypertension. So that is one understood cause, atherosclerosis. But second is this, what is called modern development, civilization, urbanization, whatever term you call it, trendy things. What is this urbanization or development? It is that lifestyle which decreases our physical activity. It is that lifestyle which makes us to consume more food than we consume, which is energy dense, which is fat dense, which is cholesterol dense, sodium dense. And it is lacking in good nutrients like potassium, like vitamins, like proteins. So what we take are empty calories. People are watching obesity trends in the USA. They found the time in 60s or 70s when most of those Burger Kings and other fast food making chains announced that they are doubling the size of their pizza or doubling the size of the boat and they are giving a Coke bottle free with that. That trend still continues. The obesity started going up. And if you know the top five countries in the world who have highest growth of diabetes is USA and the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, all those. And what is the culture there? They used to have a very active life, but you can see their ladies. Albaq is some famous food uh, chain there. Uh, Albaq, I think, chicken they made. So this is what they come in the car and take it. And it is very fair then. So that just tells the lifestyle. This has become now here also. This slide is an old slide, but it tells you the use of bicycle in different countries. You know, relatively European countries have less obesity and less diabetes, though it is, they are also now picking up as compared to Asian, as compared to uh, Americans. The reason one of them is that they use more of physical activity. You see the blue one is the, the blue, the bars the, in color blue, they represent bicycle. And you see Netherlands, Germany, England, Italy, you are seeing the blue bar somewhere. You can't see that in USA or Canada. So no physical activity. Other problem is our TV watching which has become totally automatic. Previously, when, when we got a TV, it was, I thought that was in 1980s somewhere. So TV had to be put always in the room, but the antenna had to be kept at the top. And then there had to be three person. One would be on the top and adjusting the antenna. And the other would be on the, on the compound or the uh, garden telling you which direction and the third person be controlled. So there was a lot of physical activity. So by the time you get one channel, only two channels will come those days. The channel will come, you are you done a lot of physical activity. But now you have removed for everything. I mean, you can just, from anywhere, even from uh, on moving car, you can see the TV. So TV watching has a lot of connotations. It is not just you are there. It is like screen also. This is a real, uh, this thing. Exercises are done in, I think, 2010 or somewhere when my daughters were those uh, times when you like cartoons. So they were seeing a program called Power Girls. And I just noticed what advertisements come during that Power Girls 
this thing. These are real these things. All of these advertisements are about food. Fast food, junk food, this calcium, that calcium, this glucose, this energy, this shaktiman, that thing. Why do you need so much energy when you are not moving at all? So TV watching is not just you makes you immobile, also makes you buy these foods. Because when your child asks, you can't, you will. A child may or may not take it, the rest of the you have to take. You will not throw it, so it's not good. And then we know the cell phone use, you know, this has become a big addiction now, apart from our activity, which has made our life effort in so many ways, I don't want to discuss that. And then the automation. For every program you have to have, a, you have a remote now. For fridge you have a remote, for a microwave remote, for the doorbell you have a remote, and for TV you have a remote. Now there are so many remotes and you have a master remote, so you don't move at all. So this has drastically decreased our physical activity and this has led to obesity even here. Previously when I would talk about obesity here, they would say, Kashmir mein kaha obesity hai? Ya to sare ro sukhe hai. But agar aap baitho ke kaar mein, with your front, you will see this abdomen like this. Ye lagta hai. Malab dekh jana aaj aap. Thik hai? And we did a survey about obesity long back in 99. The previous criteria showed 15% of, 7% uh, of men and 22% of women had diabetes, uh, sorry, had obesity, overweight, overweight or obesity. But when we use the modern criteria as advocated by WHO, the obesity suddenly went up. You can see the red part, bright red represents the obesity, the lower part represents the overweightness. So one third of people especially women have overweight or diabetes by present criteria. The people say, we don't eat those junk foods. They have now come here, but how it has happened? Our portion size has increased. If you see previously, we would get one pound, two pound, three pound of meat. Now we get one kg, two kg, three kg. I did just a little experiment and found that today's meat, when you take mutton from the butcher, it is hardly uh, 10, 12 pieces in one kg. But how come we would survive on a one pound of meat in our childhood days? Of course, the, the small. I ask the egg pound ke thoda karo, you could make 16 pieces. So portion size has increased anywhere you go, whether it is a dawat or at home. The, the, the mutton size has increased. Present rista used to be goshta about those days. Okay, now with this separate trami for one plate for each person, it is even worse now. At least the Goshtaba would be divided in four. Now Goshtaba is also one person, one Goshtaba. And our breads also have increased. This Sachur or Sut or Lavasa, in my childhood, there will be two sizes, 15 gram and 20, 30 gram size. Now you don't see the smaller size at all. It has also increased portion size there. And other problem is the snacks. There's nothing wrong with snacks. We all have our culture, rich culture. But problem is the snacks, when you make them, you make them in oil. Oil is supposed to be cholesterol free. But when you repeatedly heat this oil, it's an unsaturated or polyunsaturated uh, fatty acid. When you pass over a metal heated this thing, the double bonds break. It becomes a saturated fat, which is called tronus fat. It is more dangerous than the saturated fat. So this increases uh, number one, uh, saturated trans fat, and also some carcinogens, some chemicals are made, what is called EDCs, endocrine disruptive chemicals. Because when you heat it beyond, every oil has a heating point and a burning point. So most of the times you don't have any temperature regulation of oil. You go on burning till uh, you are, it is smoking. So smoke point is different, but different oils. So that is another problem with, with our lifestyle. Now, physical activity, previously at least women in urban, rural areas used to be active, even in rural, uh, urban also, but now you don't see that. And this paper from our side shows, this all over the world they have found, that we thought this obesity is increasing mainly from the urban data, but they found this obesity is coming from the rural. So rural populations become obese and overweight. And previously we used to work ourselves, but now we get this foreign labor from uh, from outside, where become what we call, I don't know what we call. 
So how to prevent it? So I'll be just giving you a few clues. I'm not going to discuss the prevention part because that is not a part of my. So first know your risk because all these diseases are lifestyle diseases are symptomless. Check your blood pressure, check your weight, check your sugar level, check your cholesterol level. And if you have them, if you have risk factors, which I already discussed, take care of those things. Increase your physical activity at least 30 minutes of brisk activity five days a week. Healthy diet is itself a debate what is a healthy diet. But if you find, you can find, there are many uh, options on that. Or we can discuss on Sunday what is a healthy diet. And of course, substance abuse, smoking, alcohol has to be stopped. The process has to be reversed. There have been experiments to prove that if you put a good lifestyle, even in two to three months, you can get a very good result. Diabetes goes, hypertension goes, obesity may decrease, if not totally go. There's a very famous series called DPP trial. Uh, this was sponsored by NH because whenever we do a drug trial, often people say it has been sponsored by a pharma company, so this, it is biased. But this was by NH, National Institutes of Health USA, which has given most of the recommendation and research to us. It was sponsored by them and they found that if you do nothing compared to that, metformin is a drug which prevents progression of diabetes from two. But if you do aggressive lifestyle, even is better than metformin. But the problem with this is that people do not sustain the aggressive lifestyle. But we have data we can prevent. So whenever in my patient, whenever a patient leaves in the OPD, the last question, first question, also last question is, what should I eat? Again, it is not easy to, I mean, to discuss because it is varies from person to person, and I cannot this is a separate talk. But please make a habit of whenever you have a food, if it is a processed food, there will be labeled. See what is in it, how many calories are there, how many proteins are there, how much sugar is there. Okay, cholesterol, sodium, all those things you should see. If it is a natural food or unprocessed food or semi-processed food, then you can again have knowledge from internet. There is a huge knowledge that how much rice plate contains, what, are the, what is the nutritional facts of rice, wheat, Samosa, whatever we take, it is not difficult to find, provided you have that will. So one of this is recommend is a Harvard is healthy plate. Again, I'm not discussing it, but you'll find so many healthy diets and plates. Though it is not necessary what diet may be good for me, may be good for you also. And activity, but we have to change it. It needs a regulation also. In many places, they have started putting tax on the fat containing foods or sugar containing foods but also needs attitude change that attitude change should come from within the society not from above whatever i tell you unless you yourself believe what is good for you bad for you you will not agree you will not do that so this is a big challenge previously we would show that in usa we would make a fun of it people you know when they go to gym to increase physical activity but they use escalator, they don't do physical activity. This is, so this is not a good attitude. But one day I was uh, coming from Sopo to Srinagar, I crossed this bridge. Second of her, uh, Seamer uh, Bridge. And I saw this picture, uh, I asked my daughter, moving car, not a, that good of quality photo. But I saw two young men, on the scooter carrying this horse. Obviously, the, the one on the pillion was holding by rope. Now, I don't know what was, they must have a real justification for taking a horse like that, but horse was not agree, but still the person would not get down, do some physical activity also. The person will go on the scooter and the horse will be following at its own speed. So this attitude has to be changed. If I want to do exercise, why should I use an escalator? Why should I use a lift? So why don't you, why don't I use the opportunity to move also? So as they say, one, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Prevention is better than cure. So if we prevent these lifestyle diseases, it will be a bigger thing. So Hippocrates said 400 years before Christ. Let food be thy medicine and medicine by the food. So food is coming in the lifestyle medicine. The food is an important medicine now. So we come to the first slide that if we have these 17 goals, we want to transform the world. We want to achieve these goals by 2013. 
we will have to improve our lifestyle in our women because that has tremendous connotation they show it will directly improve the health but apart from that all other things will improve so i believe that improving the lifestyle of women can be a key contributor to meeting the sustainable development goals of 2013 i know there will be many questions but i am i'm not sure how much time we have so i'm leaving my email as on the phone number is also my whatsapp number 9419013289 you can call me in the evening any time any day except maybe as on a sunday when i usually on the mountains like this a beautiful mount this a beautiful lake called gods or lake of greater lakes thank you very much thank you thank you dr sharik for this astute lecture it has highlighted key important factors which we need to refine for global health development particularly in women as he has stated that anybody who wants to reach him can have his email id and call him uh, on weekdays so our next i would like to invite next speaker dr amesh shah he is head department of physics national institute of technology is pr at special center for nano sciences is a reputed author researcher and currently evolving buzzing columnist so thank you dr amesha next time next time that is all right bismillah rahman rahim dost sahab sar sahab mere hum safar usatiza kiram aur aziz tulba assalam alaikum so i'll be a little bit fast my uh, director needs me some i out so uh, sharik sahab did very nice regarding the sustainable development goals and then the second thing he said so i'll be talking about how to how to address all those goals and how to achieve all those goals and the second issue i will do is that how small sense for and big society in dealing with the covid crisis and then i also uh, Why has gone this lady Humaira, who invited me? So Humaira told me that that she had never listened to me. She did reading of my articles, but I always talk about small sciences. This is a new science which has come up. That's known as a nanotechnology. It's a buzzword. So I do preach, I do teach, and I do give sermons on these nanotechnology. so regarding today's lecture the science society and sustainable development through small science these are in meshed all three are in meshed and then i'll quote you an example how all these things how this what the small science do see what sharik sahab was saying regarding health issue and then one of the major issues in sustainable development goal i'll give you an example if this quote is if this quote is now quoted with nano materials nan nano particles you see what happens not only this coat will become a wrinkle free it will give a, it will it will act as a sensor god forbid if anything goes bad well within the body it will give a buzz that such and such organ has gone bad not only to you it will give a cc to your parents that your son and a daughter need to see a doctor so this is what a small science is doing that's why i have been teaching all these things and i have been preaching all these things not only the medical sector it's almost agricultural field the engineering aspects and then the other aspects of the life and i also believe that it is going to change your life the life of your children and then the and their children and the good thing about that is that it is going to happen in this decade within this decade so the young boys and the girls are you students on the, in this college okay okay so take up this science take up it, it as a challenge there's an an career in it and you are, your life will flourish in it it's a new coming science is nanotechnology where you can solve many of the issues which people raise over here including the gender things there are many great ladies who are doing good in this sciences also 
So I'll move fast. Yeah. So what universities owe to human civilization? Humans without society cannot exist, only God suits alone. So there are entangled science, society, and technology, and the society is an extended family. So universities and colleges are indistinguishably bound into the fabric of society and have a duty and an obligation to society. So I have listed few of the issues. Okay. So I have listed few of the issues. The first one is a top healthcare issue, which Sharik Saab has had among the 30, those 17 sustainable development goals. This is one at the top. Then the water treatment and remediation, then the energy storage and production, then the food processing and storage, agriculture production, environment and pollution, starvation, sustainable materials, population explosion. These are the big issues which the world is facing and which our students need to address. None are those days when we used to read those traditional things. Now go on and take up new challenges in which the world is facing and which the humanity is facing. They are facing challenges in a health year. See now the COVID which Sharik Saab gave a 50,000 people died. Now half a billion probably. 50 crores. It's not like that. It had made in, inside all those which were flying, which were not even halting for even a second. It made world collapse. So that those things ought to be taken up and then also the climate change one of the big issues where you can excel also which you need to take up so the revolutionary forces came it came from 1800 it flourished in 20, 20th century now in 21st century, a new field has come up. The small science has come up. It is still in infancy, but it is doing miracles, which I have told you, not only in sciences, not only in agriculture, not only in medical sciences, but also in engineering fields. It has revolutionized IT. It has revolutionized the computer sciences, and it has revolutionized our materials world and the physics also. Looking back and looking forward, in 1990, when I graduated, probably from government medical uh, government college from Baramulla, there was a metallurgy in ceramics, polymer science. We used to call it as a material science. And in 21st century, there was a need for a collaborative cross-disciplinary activity, and it embraced condensed matter physics, the solid-state physics, the soft chemistry, the molecular biotechnology the biosciences rather. So it gave a name of nanoscience and the nanotechnology. It was an overlap of physical, chemical, biological, and engineering sciences. Whenever you go to that, any website of any university, just to log on to the professor's profile. Few of the people doing nanotechnology is from biology, few from zoology, few from botany, few from most from physics and chemistry people doing nanotechnology now. Probably half of the material scientists are doing nanotechnology now. You just go to the Harvard University's website, go to Cambridge, and then go to King's College London. Everywhere you will find out. And then this journey is being led by a band of scientists. And the distribution, I can say as a physicist, it's not yet clear yet. Yeah, the business at NIT Sirinagar, what we have been doing at NIT Sirinagar, and my group, uh, as, uh, as Professor told you that the H1 N1 virus was only probably less than 100 nanometers. And few of them have reported 130 nanometers. So we do prepare materials of those dimensions. 100 nanometers below than that. Most of them are below. We make these pebbles 
which are of different shape and size. See the beauty of this new science, nano science. This is the only first time in the history of a science, first time in the history of a mathematics where geometry plays a role. So all these particles have different properties. Dot up. So see the beauty of this one. We prepare the material. All of them have a different property of the same material. And this was not before. When we used to take chemistry classes, the chemistry teacher used to tell us that no, whenever you want to change the properties, change the composition of the material. Now what is there now in this science, we need to change the size of the material. So that's a technique. Make different materials of different shapes, you get a different properties and you can put them used for different purposes. So did the Faraday at his time. So, so from Faraday to follow, Michael Faraday synthesized gold nanoparticles back in 1856. So what is new? How could rust, which is a magnetic, be used to diagnose and treat diseases such as cancer? The magnetic nanoparticles, how can different shapes of gold nanoparticles such as rods or stars help with killing bacteria on surfaces? And during this COVID, many of the scientists, they worked on surfaces, materials. Surfaces can be coated with antibacterial materials so that the COVID virus and the H1 virus, H1N1 virus could not sustain over there. So he is widely credited for insightful and for the first scientific discussion on size dependent optical properties and their coagulation behavior of colloidal gold. So there are many materials which you see that, which are probably which you know that DNA 2.5 nanometers, this was one of the, um, one of the best natural nanometer and when we prepared carbon nanotube, it was of the same dimension, 2.5 nanometers. The proteins, 5 nanometers, cell membrane, the glucose, the viruses below 100 nanometers, H1N1, 90 nanometers. So the bacteria goes on. And then we, then it's in the ninth class, probably in a science, that buck minister fluorine had been introduced in the salivite. So that's also of a 1 nanometer dimension. Hopefully it may come up, carbon nanotube may come also in the salivary very soon. See this rising carbon family, I have written one chapter in my book also, on the, the rising carbon, I have written the rising carbon. So you know the graphite, you know the diamond, and in 85 the buck crystal fluorine came up, in 91 a tabular form of carbon nan nanotube came up, that's known as the carbon nanotube, and in 2004, a Russian boy came up with a wonderful material. Do you know that material? He was awarded Nobel Prize for that, that Russian boy. You don't know. A we physicists were beating our head to feel a single layer from the graphite. You just see the graphite at the down. It's a layered structure. So we could not feel a single layer of a graphite. This remained as a mystery for around 50 years. The boy came up, who was born after Russian wars. He came up, he settled in Manchester and could feel a single layer of this graphite with a very simple experiment. So that layer is known as a graphene. Graphene is doing wonders and graphene will do wonders from your mobile phones up to airplanes, from your sensors, up to the diagnostics. It will do wonders. Just go to the Google and see the graphene applications. That gentleman got a Nobel Prize. And you would and you would clap again hundred times if you know how that gentleman got this single layer of a graphite. So the graphite I have written, it's a so lighter. It's a two-dimensional material, one atom thick, but 100 times stronger than stainless steel. It has been put to use for battery, for supercapacitors, for water circulating, for fuel cells, and many more. 
Oh, this is your graphene, gentlemen. See this graphene. You write down with a pencil and you get a graphene. And now uh, to that, uh, what is that? Kazi Sahiba. Kazi Sahiba was saying that uh, women are being uh, harassed at workplaces. No, I never believe it. Whenever ladies do good, they are being acknowledged. And Obama garlanding this great lady, Millie. Millie died in 2019. She is known as the queen of carbon science. She has done wonders in this science. She got many prizes and finally that Obama came with a prize of President's Prize. See this inspiring lady, she spoke in my conference recently, Thon, she speaks about nanomaterials from bench to bedside. She works on medical physics and gives many materials which are useful for medical sciences. See this great lady, Homera. Suno of ladies ke baare mein. Suno, beto niche. Have a look on this, have a look on this lady. She's a Renu Khatar. Renu Khatar graduated in somewhere in UP. Uh, I have never gone to that place. But Kanpur, she was a political science student. She was married after four months. She cancelled her admission, went with her husband to USA. She was not knowing how to write and how to read English. After settling in the United States, she took an admission in a university, made post-graduation and then a doctorate in political science. Now she is heading one of the prestigious university of United States of America. She was not knowing after graduation how to write down. She was from a Hindi medium. This is what she told in BBC London a few days before. Renu Khatar. Renu is also being awarded by the President of the United States as well as President of the India also. So this is one of the queen of polymer sciences. Excellence is gained from diversity when we are working across this border range of experience and perspectives we make inroads into difficult problems. So this great lady, we at NIT Sirinagar Thank you very much. Thank you, Paran. Beta Lelua. Shukriya, sir. Shukriya. I greatly appreciate uh, Dr. M.A. Shah for such a big, huge lecture on small particles, nanosciences, nanoparticles. It has revamped our approach and awareness about the sciences. So now I invite uh, the, I, I will close. Yes, Professor um, uh, this Zahur um, Ahmed for concluding remarks and closing. This conference has designed a different kind of pedagogy. What we find in respect of the conferences, the seminars, we have the technical papers and technical papers are presented during the course of the activity and then they are put to question. But they have kept a specialistic talks, specialist talks from specialist persons. We had in this first technical session three specialists who delivered their talks, and all the three were aimed at developing the culture of technology, culture of scientific bent of mind amongst the young people, especially the women. I personally believe that the first talk delivered by Professor Fozia, that was basically an inspirational talk with regard to choosing mathematics as a subject by women students. Fact of the matter is that we as at our home as parents believe that we should not encourage our girl students to opt for mathematics because of being a hard subject or because of being a dry subject. A phobia has developed, a sort of phobia has developed into the minds of the parents that they would desist from encouraging their females, female girls in their homes to take up mathematics or physics or such hard subjects as their career, career options. 
This was basically an inspirational type of talk that was delivered by Professor Fozia. And then the second talk by Professor Sharik from Skims. It was basically the lifestyle diseases that we are presently facing. Most of us are presently facing because of the development in the technology. We, we, we come to advancement, sustainable goals, sustainable objectives of the United Nations, which aim at overall development of the societies, economic growth of the societies, and lifestyle problems, lifestyle diseases are something that are attached to the overall economic growth and prosperity of the societies. So he also suggested some of the remedies that we can take up, some of the preventive measures that we can take up to deal with these lifestyle diseases. And it was really an informative talk. Then the last one, last but not the least one, Professor Shah, whom we find very uh, elaborative in respect of smaller sciences, small sciences, nano sciences, nanotechnology, which is now trying to become the, uh, the uh, order of the day. I, I think people from biosciences, people from particularly the material sciences, physics, mathematics, would definitely take up nanotechnology, nanosciences as their option because future, as we perceive, is going to be nanoscience-based society. Therefore, we must take some clues from the talk that has been delivered by Professor Shah during the course of this technical session. I compliment all the three speakers who actually participated and uh, delivered their specialistic talks during the course of this technical session. Professor Fozia, Professor Sharik, and Professor Shasa. With these words, we conclude this technical session and we hope that we meet again tomorrow during the course of some other technical sessions. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for active participation. I the session stands closed today. So we'll see you tomorrow at 9:30. 9:45. Thank you all.